Okay, so that was a great start of the day. Good swim here at my mom's place. And I'm now gonna get a coffee before traveling back home. And I'm preparing myself for my Sunday night grind later today. So I'm gonna bring you guys with me, see what all comes up today. And other than that, let's get started. One of the things I really love about traveling by train is that I can use this time to study PLO. Today, a while on the road, I am using PLO Trainer to test myself on my preflop 3-bet game, small blind against the button. And as you can see, I'm on my mobile and I can use my time basically to quiz myself on this spot. It turns out I can definitely do better and probably have to train myself a little bit more often. So arriving here in my office, I actually see that there's a high stakes PLO game running on GG Poker. So I think I'm gonna jump into a live stream for about an hour and also use that to, to warm up, think about poker strategy a bit, look into some hands that these guys are playing and then jump into the session myself. So let's get into it, open up YouTube, start the live stream and maybe I will see you guys in there. That was a lot of fun. Had some good conversations with the people in the chat. Also did some training on my pre-flop ranges as a way to warm up basically before my session. It made me realize that it's so important to keep working on your pre-flop ranges as a poker player. It's easy to forget about it in a way and think that you know them. But I just played around a little bit over 100 hands, for example. I made so many mistakes and some of them I was very confident that I made the right play, but it wasn't actually. So time to sharpen them up, work a bit more on preflop in the coming weeks. And um, now it's time to play some PLO. I open raise the cutoff, king, king, jack, seven, very, very standard, even though we don't have the king high suit. And against the three bet, I'm in a very uncomfortable spot. In theory, my hand is breaking even between folding and calling, so don't overvalue a hand like this against the three bet. And on the flop, I think I have a very straightforward call. We have an over pair and a spade blocker. We have top pair on the board as well, so let's make a call. We improved to trips and against a double barrel again. I don't think there is much else to do than just call. We are ahead of his bluffs. There's no reason really to race because he will only call with hands that are beating us. So uh, let's just call and on the river, I'm in this bluff catching scenario. I do think we'll sometimes have to call here. My opponent wrapping the nut flush, he's not holding a ton of boats on this run out. So I think he will play the ace of spades very often the same way. Unfortunately, this time he did have the nut flush and I lose the pot. Beautiful hand, three betting standard against an undergun open. We are pretty deep, 250 big blinds. And the big blind also decides to overcall in this situation. Now, usually this doesn't happen that often. And if people do it, it's often a range of unpaired, single suited or double suited, very connected rundowns that are just not strong enough to four bet or a little bit too good to fold. Think like king high, queen high, jack high connected rundowns. Sometimes double suited, eight high or seven high, very connected rundowns. And also some of the best kings and queens that are connected and just not good enough to four bet basically. So my three bet very standard, of course, we go three way to a flop, queen nine five. 
I flop bottom pair and the nut flush draw, of course, together with my over pair, both players check. And I do believe that I want to bet here, even though we are pretty deep and getting raised, especially by under the gun, wouldn't be great. But I think we just have so much equity and the five is definitely a valuable blocker in a sense that I do want to build a pot. Player who did decide to overcall preflop calls. I think at that point when he calls, he's basically saying he has top hair with some form of backup, basically. I think any top two or better will just check raise on the flop. Also, any rep with a flush draw will probably check raise. And once he checks on the turn eight, I don't think that he has jack 10 really. Like I would say based on my experience, most players will just open shove or at least lead out on the turn if they have jack 10 really, really often. Even 7-6 will lead out with a good amount of time. I'm blocking 7-6 with the 7. So that made me think that I think very often I have either still the best hand because my opponent is sitting on, for example, king-queen with diamonds or that I still have either full equity or a lot of equity or at least enough equity to get the money in. So I decided to double barrel here for a full pot. I don't think we want to use any other sizing if we bet because the board is so draw heavy. Unfortunately, my opponent did improve to a two pair holding king-queen, 10-8, very loose and wide pre-flop overcall. And um, yeah, unfortunately, I do end up losing this pot. I think the turn is close. Maybe it's a check. I'm not entirely sure. Anyway, I do lose and now let's move on. This is a mistake that I open raised king 10, 9, 4, single from the cutoff. This is just too loose, too weak, too disconnected. I do have two very tight players on my left though, so that will increase my fold equity. Basically making the open race a little bit better in a sense. But still, I would say it's overall too loose, especially if you look into the big blind who overall has a pretty high VPIP and is unlikely to fold preflop. Against a 3-bet, I decide to call. It's not a great spot, but we are pretty deep. I'm in position. I have some connections, so let's call. The board has jack-jack 9. I uh, have a pair and a gutter. I can check. I can bet. I think both lines are viable at this point. We do want to find some bluffs, of course, because we will have some value as well in this pot so a nine is of course our prime blocker so i decided to bet and basically go from there i got check called barrel on the turn again my opponent calls and on the river i think it's pretty important here to keep barreling the thing is like it's quite difficult to come up with bluffs at this point the nine is really our best blocker that we can have and we will have plenty of jack x that we're betting for value here. A 9x at this point has basically no showdown value because my opponent is very likely holding aces, kings, queens. Unlikely holding a jack or better in my, in my opinion because he would often either bet or check raise at some point in the hand. Yes, sometimes he will have a jack and call me down. But the fact that we need bluffs in our range, the fact that we have plenty of value, makes me think that we do want to come up with this bet. The fact that we have a king is probably not that great because we want our opponent to have, for example, king-king and then check call twice and then fold the river. So maybe the king is a little bit... Or the, maybe the king speaks a little bit more for checking. I decided to go for it because I believe that against triple barrels, people generally slightly overfold. Anyway... My opponent did end up folding and I do win the pot. Let's look into one more hand where I three bet queen 987 double suited from the small blind against the button. Very standard, beautiful hand of course. And let's take it from there. Button makes the call and on this board we can really go either way, bet or check. In theory it's basically breaking even. I decided to check and go for a check raise. I think my hand fits that line pretty well. We have a lot of components, but also a lot of non-nutted components. My opponent, unfortunately, checks back. Turn is the deuce. I decided to check again with the intention to also check raise the turn. He checks again and on the river, I could bet and turn my hand at that point into a bluff, trying to fold out a jack, for example. I didn't go for it. Maybe it's a mistake, actually. I'm not entirely sure. I probably like to see myself betting there to fold out a jack 
to Fallout 1010, for example, hands that I'm still losing against. Now my opponent decided to check back the flop with Queen Jack 1010. I think it's okay, but I'm not sure if I really like it that much. He definitely has a lot of components that favor a bet. He has like two tens, he has a diamond in his hand, he blocks top hair. He can put a lot of pressure on aces and kings that don't have a lot of backup. Even though he has a gutter and if he bets he get check, gets check raised, it's really uncomfortable. I probably like to see a bet in his shoes basically. But um, he checks and he does win the pot and uh, I lose this one. We got the final table of a Triton poker event in the back. Phil Ivey is on it. Let's see if he's going to win it. I just finished my session and I played for about five to six hours. Overall, I must say, first part was quite bad. Felt very unhappy and frustrated throughout the session. Didn't feel good at all. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it was. Got to think a little bit more about it. But I took a break in the middle and then the second part went much better. I was much more focused, dealing better with losses, overall more enjoyed that part of the session. Not necessarily because of the result, more that I was just way more grounded throughout the session. So ended up winning about five buy-ins, that is close to a thousand dollars. Happy with the result and also with the experience of tonight. Definitely learned a bit more about myself and the way I'm playing at the moment and how I can do things better. Anyway, gonna watch this a little bit more before heading back home, going to bed and uh, closing down the night.